Open your Bibles to the 23rd Psalm. 23rd Psalm. Going to mix things up a little bit, and I'm going to preach, or uh, I'm going to, excuse me, that won't be mixing it up. I've been preaching. Um, Paul, we're going to mix it up. You'll preach today. <laughs> um, no, I'm going to read the text. Uh, first thing out, you'll hear, this is the New American Standard Bible's translation of it. So here we go. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege of reading and thinking about the 23rd Psalm today, and for your grace toward us that it represents And now I ask you that you would help me to preach faithfully from this passage in your word and that you would help us all to receive it with reverence and humility. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we all seem to know that life is a journey or even more a story. It has a beginning, it has an end, it has a meaning. You could say it has a plot, there are movements in the story and crises that develop and resolution and we believe and rightly so that our lives have a purpose they're going somewhere we're going somewhere and that understanding of our lives is so uh, entrenched in our in, in us it's it's woven into who, who we are you can see it in in literature that goes back as far as some of the oldest works that uh, that we have on record anywhere the, the Odyssey is an example of that. Homer's Odyssey is a story of a guy that's trying to get home after a war and faces all kind of difficulties and encounters uh, friendship along the way and hardship along the way as he struggles to make his way home. Classic allegory, the Pilgrim's Progress. Pilgrim, aptly named, makes his way through many dangers, toils, and snares, as the song puts it to the celestial city, to the home that he anticipates finding there. And in more recent favorites of mine, there are accounts of hobbits who go from there and back again, right? Guided by providence, if you have eyes to see it in Tolkien, and facing dangers, finding that friendship is essential to the journey, and ever longing for home. These stories strike us, they stay with us, they mean so much to us because they're our story. We recognize ourselves in them. We know that they are true in some sense. They're true stories. We recognize the ups and the downs, the fear of evil, the hope for good, the need for friendship, and that ever-present longing for home in them. When we come to the 23rd Psalm today, we find a prayer of trust in which the psalmist reflects on his own life as a journey in which he experiences the Lord's provision and protection at every step. Now, it's a psalm of David, which can mean a lot of different things. At the very least, it means that it's associated with David. And so we might say some things about David's life, for example, that David's life certainly had ups and downs. You might recognize him from some accounts of his life as a victorious giant slayer uh, whose valiant uh, and uh, self-sacrificial courage in the face of uh, an opponent far too big from him results in the salvation of many lives and the freedom of his people. And you look at that and you say, there's a hero on the order of Jesus, right? And then, of course, there are other accounts of his life that include the betrayal of a faithful friend to death. You say, man, he looks more like Judas there. You might remember that he was the, the least and the last of seven brothers, was small, underappreciated, undervalued, uh, often invisible. Some of you can identify with that. 
And yet he grew to become a mighty king. Small though he was, undervalued though he was, he had a big heart. He had great faith. He knew what it was to be alone, to be misunderstood, to lose friends, to be falsely accused, to be betrayed. His relationship with his oldest son is tragic. Due in part to his own failures as a father, the relationship with Absalom deteriorates to the point where Absalom wants nothing to do with him and in fact decides to ruin him in every respect and loses his own life in the process and David has to bury Absalom, his oldest son, has to bury his oldest son without ever having been reconciled to him. David lost a child a few days after his birth as well and so it's no wonder that the 23rd Psalm has been a favorite prayer for those experiencing loss experiencing uncertainty, experiencing grief, experiencing trial. We love it. We love this psalm because it gives voice to our faith that God will lead us through the deepest, darkest valleys into green pastures and then ultimately into life in His presence forever. We love the 23rd psalm because it gives voice to our faith that God is with us in all of life, providing, protecting, working, as we've sung today, working toward our ultimate good. Now, the, the essence of this psalm in one sentence, and I'm going to say it in first person as the 23rd psalm is in first person. I'm going to say it this way, although it's, we could say it in a we sense too, and I'll say that as well. But if you were to boil the, the, the 23rd psalm down to one statement, it would be this. I lack nothing I need. And I fear nothing I face because the Lord is with me, protecting me, and providing for me for my ultimate good. Now, the structure of the psalm is governed by two metaphors. Two metaphors. We're most familiar with the first metaphor, the Lord is my shepherd, shepherd, sheep. There's an analogy, right, in the relationship between a shepherd and a sheep to the relationship between God and his people. The second metaphor essential to the psalm, to understanding it, is that of a host. Think of a, uh, a, a, a dinner where there's a, a host into whose home you come. And so that relationship between host and guest is also analogous to our experience as God's people. And so that's the, where the title comes from, in the flock and in the home, in the flock and in the home. Now, one other thing I want to say about the psalm just in, in broad uh, strokes so that we'll understand it better as we go, is that the, the verbs that occur throughout this psalm tend to be all of one tense. There's like one exception to it. But they're all this imperfect tense. And why does that matter? Well, here's, some of you will already have noticed because you're familiar with the King James Version of the 23rd Psalm because it's so ingrained in our, in our English heritage, Right? You'll notice, well, that sounds different the way Justin read it out of the New American Standard. And some of you might be looking at an NIV or an ESV and it sounds a little different. Um, One of the key differences you'll find in different versions of this uh, this psalm has to do with what they do with these verbs. And so, he makes me, makes me lie down, right? He makes me, he leads me, he restores me, he guides me. All those verbs in those clauses, they're generalizations, They're generalizations. That's what that tense is doing. And so I I maybe compare it to like if you think of a grandparent sitting talking with with, uh, maybe a grandchild about some aspect of their life over all these years, how you might generalize. You say, this happened or this is the way the Lord protected me or provided for me. You're speaking in general terms about the whole quality of your experience with the Lord over time. That's what's happening here. Okay. So let's explore the first metaphor. The Lord is my shepherd, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, some scholars rightly have picked up allusions to the Exodus, Israel's departure from Egypt uh, through the wilderness toward the promised land, these these wilderness wanderings. And I'm going to give you some examples of this. So for example, in Psalm 78, 19, the uh, psalmist describes Israel's response to the experience of need in the wilderness by saying the psalmist says Israel asked of God can 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 God prepare a table can he prepare a table in the wilderness and of course we hear this language in the 
uh, in the 23rd Psalm that God prepares a table. Uh, Jeremiah, in chapter 2, verse 6, Jeremiah compares the wilderness through which Israel left Egypt with, quote, the land of the shadow of death. And here in verse 1, I shall not be in want or I will lack nothing, as some will translate it, contains the same idea and even the same term that we find in Deuteronomy 2.7 where Moses speaks to God's people on the, in the space or in the, in the transition from outside the wilderness headed into the promised land. Right at that transition point, he speaks these words. He says, for the Lord your God has blessed you in all that you have done. He has known your wanderings through this great wilderness. Boy, there's a sentence that's beautiful. He has known your wanderings. He has known your wanderings through this great wilderness. These 40 years, the Lord your God has been with you. You have not lacked a thing. Now, Deuteronomy 2.7 and the first verse of the 23rd Psalm are communicating a lesson that God's people need to learn that I need to learn. And it's this, in the valley of the shadow, in the dark places, it's hard to see that there's any good purpose in it, any good reason for it. And it's easy to doubt that the Lord will provide and protect. And yet that's what God's people did in the wilderness over and over again. Can God provide for us? Can he protect us? And I'll venture to say for myself that in the past year, I have prayed the 23rd Psalm more than the entire rest of my life. Because when we experience the darkest places, the valley of the shadow, the crisis calls forth faith from God's people. And we say with God's people throughout the ages, the Lord is my shepherd. He's with me here. I will not give in to fear because I trust God to protect and to provide. Now, we're going to read verses 2 to 4 in a second here, but we need, to, we need to read those with some awareness of the biblical topography that's assumed in them. And so I'm going to read to you from Gerald Wilson's account of that so that as you read this portion of the psalm, uh, hopefully the, the imagery will pop uh, a little more. So here's Gerald Wilson. He says, at best, the land is a dry, rocky set of rolling hills covered with a sparse and tough grass. Water sources are few and often seasonal. Shepherds had to be ready to take their flocks on long migrations from one source of grazing and water to another. He goes on, he says, I remember hiking down Wadi Kelt from Jerusalem to Jericho with a friend. This is a, 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 a riverbed that's, that's got water when it's rained enough and can be dry when it hasn't. Listen to this description. A narrow ancient Roman aqueduct, still flowing with water, clung to the canyon wall at a height of several hundred feet. We began our journey following the rugged footpath on the opposite canyon wall, dipping at points to the bottom of the wadi and back up to the other side. It only took about two such trips down into the shadowy depths of the stifling heat at the wadi bottom, and this was early in the morning, and scrambling back up the steep limestone wall to regain the path Before we overcame our natural reluctance of heights and continued our journey walking along the outer rim of the aqueduct or in the most narrow portions in the aqueduct itself. Just in case you didn't catch what he's saying, they came to this wadi, they looked at this valley, this ravine, and they said, hey, look at that aqueduct that's hundreds of feet above the floor. We could travel along that but that looks really scary. So let's just take the footpath over here on this opposite side. And they, did, they, had, they went up and down as the path led them twice. And then they decided it would be better if we walked on that Roman aqueduct hundreds of feet in the air. That's how treacherous and how difficult the journey was to them. That's what he's saying. He goes on. He says... Um, So they did. They continued the journey on the aqueduct. Even so, my two-liter bottle of water was depleted halfway through our journey. And when we stopped at St. George's Monastery to replenish our supply, the water tap in the courtyard first emitted only steam and then a grudging stream of almost boiling water. I had enough trouble dragging myself up and down those rocky hills. I cannot imagine the difficulty of herding a whole flock of sheep through the valley of the shadow of death. Now, 
Psalm 23, 2 to 4. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The point here is that God's provision is what sustains us in what is otherwise an inhospitable landscape, in otherwise inhospitable circumstances. The key idea here is that the Lord takes responsibility for our well-being. He takes responsibility for our well-being, and He leads us through places of danger and ruin into places of wholesomeness, flourishing, where there's life and life can be sustained. And sometimes it's necessary to go through one to get to the other. And sometimes, the truth is, we've strayed off the path against the leading of our shepherd and have found ourselves in places that are very treacherous. And the Lord leads us. He calls to us to follow him out of those places to places where there is flourishing, where there is wholesomeness, where there is restoration. Now, one thing I'm sure of is that the Lord perfectly knows how to guide each one of his sheep down the right paths into perfect pasture. The scripture says that he does this for his name's sake. He guides us down paths of righteousness for his name's sake. To talk about his name's sake is to talk about his character. What the psalmist is saying is he guides me in a way that's consistent with who he is. I can trust him as a guide. You think about anybody that you have faith in, you have faith in them, you trust them, Typically, it's because of who they are, what their character is like, right? I trust you. I will follow you. I will listen to what you say because I know your character. And what the psalmist is saying is, I know that when my shepherd leads me, even when I walk through a valley of the shadow, I know the character of my shepherd, and I can follow him. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd By the way, in contradistinction to bad shepherds, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. And Jesus' call to each one of us as his sheep is, follow me. Follow me. I want to pause to ask, who are you following today? And for us to collectively remember that we can trust Our Lord, the Good Shepherd, in whatever paths, down whatever paths, He is leading us because He leads us in consistent, uh, in a way that's consistent with His perfect character, His perfect love. Now, by way of aside, there's a pastoral ministry application here that I think is worthy of bringing out. The New Testament refers to people like me as a pastor, the term poimen, it means shepherd. We like this term pastor because it helps us know I literally don't keep sheep, you know? It, keeps us, it helps us keep clear. But I'm a shepherd. The New Testament also says I'm an under-shepherd. There's a chief shepherd, and we're all his sheep. He's the one that's leading us. He's the head of the body. He's the chief shepherd. Whatever we do as pastors, we do as under-shepherds. But here's the pastoral ministry application that I think is essential for us to get. in in a way analogous to what the psalmist is saying about Jesus, ultimately Jesus, our shepherd, in a way analogous, we follow under shepherds based primarily on their character, on their character. We trust them based on their character. For example, if you were to go to 1 Timothy 3, you would find a list of qualifications for pastoral ministry that are expressed. And in that list, you will find over 10 I think the number is actually 14, but you can check that. Over 10 different character-based qualifications and one that has to do with teaching. Okay? Now, two things we can learn from that. One, one that we can learn from that is that it's important for pastors to be able to teach the Word of God. We need to be able to do that faithfully. It's important. The other thing that we can learn from texts like these is that the overwhelming emphasis of the Bible... For pastors is on character, 
character. That's essential to pastoral ministry. Character, not talent, not charisma, not the ability to entertain, not an impressive resume. Character is essential. And yet, in my experience, I'm not talking just about, I'm talking about American churches in general. We have bought a vision for a kind of mega church where, where the gifts, the talents, the charisma, the, the, um, the wow of men is kind of what we want to huddle around. And the Bible's given us a different vision, and I'm saying that to us with some fear and trepidation because I'm a pastor. And I know it's easier to develop talent than it is to develop character. But what you need from me is character. You need character. Before we move past this portion of the text, I'd like to suggest one more point of application. We, brothers and sisters, we, brothers and sisters, are not only being led through the valley of the shadow to places of restoration, we are places of restoration for people. I heard a story earlier uh, this past week. It was was awesome. It's a perfect picture of this. John uh, Griffin, who's the worship leader on the Beaumont campus, has been to Ukraine many times on mission trips and has some deep relationships with some pastors and churches there. And he was describing what one of these churches in Ukraine uh, did recently. And it, it just perfectly captures this. So this church, and you can imagine how scarce resources like fuel would be in certain places, especially in Ukraine right now. This church had pulled together among themselves 50 gallons of fuel. Okay? There was a family, eight people traveling in one vehicle, trying to get out of a heavily shelled, very difficult part of the country where, where the worst of the fighting was, trying to get out, trying to get to safety. They pass through, they come into contact with this particular church. And what this church did was they put them up for the night in the basement where it was safer. And then out of that 50 gallons of fuel, they filled their car up. And gave them some fuel to take on the way to get them where they were going. And I would submit to you that not only is that church being led by a shepherd through a valley of a shadow of death to a place of restoration, but the the good shepherd led that family to a church that was a place of provision and protection. And that's our calling. That's who we are as brothers and sisters in Christ. Now we come to the second metaphor, the Lord is my sanctuary. The Lord is my sanctuary. The title, In the Flock and in the Home, I'm, I'm using the, the, the term sanctuary to reflect just the idea of a home as the way it should be. Now, these two metaphors work together to fill out the picture of the psalm because in some ways we are analogous to sheep. In some ways our relationship to God's analogous, in that, but not in every respect. Not in every respect. And the second metaphor greatly enhances the picture of our relationship with God by, by this shift from in the flock to in the home. Uh, how many of you have read the book Lone Survivor? Many? Okay. How many of you have watched the movie? Okay, more of you. I'm thrilled right now. I haven't watched the movie, but I've read the book. Um, and uh, I'm thrilled because I have a really awesome Hobbit example that I'm not going to use because I figured y'all know Lone Survivor better, and right I am. So, uh, so as the story goes, right, you have a Navy SEAL team deep in Afghanistan, who, through circumstances that they didn't foresee, become surrounded by way too many Taliban fighters, like 80 plus, maybe as much as 140, four four SEALs. And in the midst of this firefight, uh, which is described in great detail in the book, uh, Marcus Luttrell, who is the lone survivor, the only one that survived that, Marcus Luttrell is shot blown off the side of the mountain at various points uh, by RPGs, ends up, got a bullet in his leg, shrapnel, blood everywhere, fatigued, broken vertebrae, the whole deal, and he's still being pursued, still being pursued by Taliban fighters, and is just taking the next, I say step, sometimes it was crawling, but to try to get to a place where he can find relief, some kind of help, some kind of provision and protection. And he's on his way and uh, uh, trying to make his way through those mountains. And at one point, he finds himself surrounded again. But this time, he's not surrounded by Taliban, though he doesn't know it. He's surrounded by some tribesmen from a local village of Pashtuns. 
And these Pashtuns surround him, and he's in such a position that he does something he says he's never done before. He lays down his rifle and just has to throw himself at their mercy. And what they do is they provide something that they call loke warkawal. I don't know what that means uh, in, in their language precisely, but he translates it as giving of a pot. And, uh, and, but loke, this, this thing that they extend to him, we would call it hospitality in the fullest sense of the word. Hospitality in the biblical sense of the word is what they extend to him. And what they do is they take him into their village, they treat his wounds, they get him water, they feed him, and then even when the Taliban are surrounding this village demanding to be able to take him, they won't let him. They won't let the Taliban take him. That is exactly the picture of what the psalmist is describing in the second part of this psalm. So let's read it now. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want to briefly draw attention to each of these phrases so that you'll know something about what they're meaning. Table, prepare a table for me. It's food, it's provision, but it's more than provision. It's fellowship, it's friendship. To sit at the table is to be a guest in the home. In the presence of my enemies obviously connotes protection. Anoint my head with oil is probably the one you're not sure what to do with. And so I want to say something about that. That anoint, anointing can be used in different ways in the Old Testament. They all fit here. I'll tell you what I think about it in just a minute. But just so you know the, the range. It can be the idea of treating with medicine. You, you treated me. You anointed me with oil. And you treated my wounds. It can be the idea of... And I couldn't come up with a great way to express this, but it's like the last step in our cleaning up process. So like, uh, I don't know if it's TMI, but for me, the last step is the deodorant, get out of the shower, dry it off, everything's good. The last thing, put the deodorant on. Or maybe aftershave, right? You've, you've, that's the last step, and now I'm emerging in the world <sighs> fresh and clean, right? That's another way that the Bible uses the, the concept of anointing. It anoints that last step of, of refreshing in other places, it's, it's to honor or to, um, to, to, to exalt a person. And all those fit the context. But I think the best sense for this, I think the best sense for this, some of you are laughing, you're glad I used deodorant, I think. Um, <laughs> amen. Um, but, uh, well, oh gosh, I shouldn't have done that. Now I'm off track. Where was I? Oh, oh, I was trying to tell you what it, yeah, what it, what it ultimately means. So, so the way that the syntax, what I think is suggested is it's the, the experience would be like this. The, 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 the beleaguered, uh, grimy uh, stranger who's made his way through this inhospitable enemy still pursuing comes into the home and now before he sits at the table, he gets cleaned up and is completely refreshed and sits at the table like that. That's the image. That's what God does for us when he brings us into his home and our cup overflows. Now, we see this concept. This is hospitality. There's this, this word in, in New Testament Greek, philoxenia. You might know the term xenophobia, where you fear of outsiders, right? That, that, that side of the, xenos is the Greek for, for strange or other or, or, or foreigner. And you probably recognize the term philos, like Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. Love, love of foreigner, love of stranger, hospitality. That's what hospitality is, love of the other. We see it in the Bible all over the place when, when Lot brings those men, angels, he doesn't know it, but brings the men into his house. He's protecting, providing. That's hospitality. And that's what God does for us. God calls us into his home. God in Christ brings about this reversal where enemies that once pursued us now love his love and his goodness pursue us relentlessly wherever we go. This in-the-home-at-the-table metaphor provides a profound glimpse of who God is and how he relates to us, what it is that God does for us in our need and what God working within us does for others through us. Provision and protection 
Sometimes we conceive of those in the barest physical sense. Sometimes it's what we mean when we say charity or humanitarian aid. But this psalm is presenting a a, a wholer picture, a picture of protection and provision that's much more. It's meeting the need of the whole person, honoring them as 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 a whole human being as you provide and protect. In other words, it's more than humanitarian aid. It's hospitality. It's more than charity. It's communion. It's the dirty, beleaguered stranger becoming not just a charity case, but an honored guest at the table because our needs aren't just physical. They're relational. They're emotional. They're spiritual. And all of them sort of are tangled together. That's what hospitality is. That's what communion means. This is our calling. This is our church. This is who we are. It's so much about the way that we relate to one another in relationship, hospitality, and communion. This is the gospel. This is the gospel. And I know I fall short of it. But when I consider these things, it might... It's like the road to Emmaus, the guys, their hearts burn within them. That's what happens when I read the 23rd Psalm and I think about what the Psalm is describing about who God is and who his people are. My heart burns within me to be that kind of community. There's hospitality, there's love for one another that's like this in the house, at the table. This is Jesus with Matthew and his friends. Let's be at the table together. This is Jesus with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, I want to I wanna come over to your house. Can we, can we hang out together? And it's Jesus with us forever. And I'm out of time, so I'm going to skip some really wonderful scriptures that you can, uh, you'll have to follow up on your own and think about this more. But with the 23rd song, we pray with faith from our position in the Lord's flock and at the Lord's table in his home. And the crises of our life call forth the kind of faith that we hear in this psalm. God is with us. Jesus will lead me. He will guide me. He will provide and he will protect for our ultimate good. So we consider as we go, who who are we following? You know, who, who are you following today? Who do you trust? What path of righteousness is the Lord calling you down? What is he calling you to do or to believe today? To what place of restoration is the Lord leading you? Through what valley of the shadow of death is he leading you? Let's consider this as we pray together now. Father, thank you for this day. For this is a chance to be together as a church for the 23rd Psalm. Thank you for your graciousness toward us in calling us into a community that's built on these very things in your flock, in your home. As we consider now in time of response, how to respond, God, move in us. Cause us to respond in faith. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.